Now Zambia announces 21 days of mourning for the founding father, Kenneth Kaunda. Now later on in the bulletin, we take you through the life of Kenneth Kaunda. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nahabu Kajira, but first are the headlines. The Parliamentary Appointments Committee rejects two ministers. And Zambia announces 21 days of mourning for the founding father, Kenneth Kaunda. And in our sports today, Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games first batch of team Uganda flagged off. Now, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And Africa Today starts with one of our top stories. Now, having concluded the vetting process of appointed ministers yesterday, the Parliamentary Appointments Committee has rejected two ministers. Our reporter Kawala has more. The first was the designated minister for Well Triangle, Miss Alice Kawoyo, who was implicated in the government corruption scandal and the anti-corruption court, and was supposed to pay 20 million shillings as a fine, which she has not done. The second one is the designated minister for trade, cooperatives and industry, Francis Muevesa, whose academic papers were questioned, claiming some of the academic papers got burnt in the bush war of NRM. Meanwhile, there is also one vacant minister position of Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs. Batuli Kawala, reporting for TV Africa. Well, thank you so much, our reporter. Now, the defense team of former Lord's Resistance Army Commander Dominique Ongwen has filed an appeal challenging his conviction by the International Criminal Court. We have more on this report. On February 4th, Ongwen was convicted of 61 crimes including murder, rape, torture and forced marriage committed in northern Uganda in 2003 and 2004. Subsequently, the Hague-based court on May 6th sentenced the former child soldier to 25 years in jail for war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in northern Uganda. Ongwen 45 is the first Ugandan and former Lord's Resistance Army commander to be tried, convicted and sentenced by the court. Mr. Crispus Ayena Odong, the lead defense counsel, told the Daily Monitor this week that the team is set for the appeals briefing next month. He said they were able to raise some critical and technical legal components of the trial which they think were messed up. Upon filling the brief by the defense team, the court is expected to fix a date for all arguments by the former. Mr. Ayen said they were also preparing grounds to appeal against the sentencing through the same procedures. He said judges Bartram Schmidt and Peter Kovacs gave the 25-year sentence while their counterpart Raul Kano Pangalangan gave a dissenting opinion that would have sentenced Mr. Ongwen to 30 years imprisonment. The chamber imposed individual sentences for each crime, taking the mitigating circumstance of Ongwen's childhood and abduction by the Lord's Resistance Army into due account. The trial chamber analyzed one by one the gravity of each of the 61 crimes for which Ongwen was convicted, finding several aggravating circumstances applicable to some or even most crimes, the court said. According to ICC, aggravating circumstances included particular cruelty, the multiplicity of victims, the victims being particularly defenseless, and discrimination on political grounds, and discrimination against women. Well, thank you so much, our reporter. Now, moving on, the health minister, Dr. Ruth Ochen, said on Thursday that private hospitals, which have been hiking medical bills, for COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit or to apologize to the public, urging that it's not time for them to make money. A reporter has more. According to Minister Aching, it's unacceptable that some hospitals are charging up to 5 million Ugandan shillings per day to care for a COVID-19 patient. The interview happened just hours after Ms. Aching's ministry Say 34 more Ugandans succumbed to COVID-19 on June 15th as the total number of fatalities rose to 542 since March last year when the outbreak was confirmed in the country. According to the ministry officials, 1,584 more people tested positive for the virus 
as the total number of confirmed cases rose to 67,215. Ms. Acheng said there are 950 active cases on admission in different health centers across the country, with only 812,118 Ugandans out of a total population of 41 million vaccinated so far. Of this, a little over 8,000 have received their second jab. According to the government, a total of 48,823 people have recovered and only 1,228,618 tested for the virus since March last year. Ms. Acheng also said only 69,000 out of 150,000 targeted health workers had been vaccinated against the virus. Well, let's go for a quick break. We shall come back with our international news. Welcome back from the break. still watching TV Africa, the right to know. Now, in our international news today, Zambia's government has announced 21 days of national mourning for the former president, Kenneth Kaunda, who died peacefully on Thursday of pneumonia at a military hospital where the 97-year-old has been receiving treatment since Monday. The government of Zambia has declared 21 days of national mourning with flags flying at half-mast and all forms of entertainment suspended in honor of the now deceased leader who was popularly and affectionately known as Keke by his people. The Zambia president, Edgar Lungu, has expressed deep regret and sorrow at the passing of the nation's beloved founding father, icon and global statesman, Kenneth Kaunda. Kenneth Kaunda was the head of the main nationalist party, the left of Centre United National Independence Party that led the country after the colonial era. While in power for 27 years after Zambia's independence from Britain on October 28, 1964, Keke became known as Africa's Gandhi due to his fight as an activist for independent movement, racial justice and equality for black people in other countries in the region. Well, still about Kenneth Kaunda. In the 1950s, Kaunda was a key figure in what was then Northern Rhodesia's independence movement from Britain. Now, let's take you through the true life of comrade Kenneth Kaunda. Kenneth David Kaunda was born on 28th April 1924 at a mission station near the border between what was then Northern Rhodesia and the Congo. His father, an ordained Church of Scotland minister, died while he was still a child, leaving the family in straitened circumstances. The young Kaunda's academic ability won him a place in the first secondary school to be formed in Northern Rhodesia and he later became a teacher. His work took him to the country's Copper Belt region and to southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, where for the first time he experienced and deeply resented the full impact of white domination. During his endeavors, Kaunda harbored political exiles from South Africa in his country and clashed with Margaret Thatcher in particular over her position to sanctions against the apartheid regime. One of his first political acts was to become a vegetarian in protest at a policy that forced Africans to go to a separate window at butchers to buy meat. In 1953, he became the general secretary of the Northern Rhodesian African National Congress, but the organization failed to mobilize black Africans against the white-ruled Federation of Rhodesia and in Iceland. Two years later, he was imprisoned with hard labor for distributing leaflets that the authorities deemed subversive. 
disillusioned with what he saw as the failure of his party to take a stronger line on the rights of indigenous Africans. Kaunda set up his own party, the Zambian African National Congress, which was banned just within a year after his re-arrest and incarceration. By 1960, he had become the leader of the new United National Independence Party and fired with enthusiasm. Following a visit to Martin Luther King in the U.S., he began his own program of civil disobedience, which involved blocking roads and burning buildings. Kaunda stood as a UNIP candidate in the 1962 elections, which saw an uneasy coalition with the African National Congress take power in the legislature. The Federation of Rhodesia and New Zealand was dissolved at the end of 1963, and a month later, Kaunda was elected Prime Minister of Northern Rhodesia. The country, renamed as Zambia, gained full independence in October 1964 with Kaunda as its first president from 1964 to 1991. In contrast, he remained a staunch defender of Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe's policy of land reform under which white farmers were driven from the country, resulting in economic meltdown. He turned his attention to the fight against HIV and AIDS and was the first African leader to publicly admit that one of his sons, Masuzo, had died of an AIDS-related disease. May his soul rest in eternal peace. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Now, moving on after 10 years in exile abroad, the former president of Côte d'Ivoire, Laurent Gbagbo, touched down on home soil on Thursday after receiving permission to return from the government of longtime rival, President Alassane Ouattara. We have more. Tensions between the jubilant crowds and security forces were high with tear gas being used to disperse people coming to greet Gbagbo near the airport. Gbagbo somehow managed to navigate his way around the frenzy of supporters via heavily security-clad vehicles to his political party's campaign headquarters in Kokodo, where he expressed elation to be back in the Cote d'Ivoire on the motherland. After an eight-year wait for his trial on war crimes charges, a judge acquitted him in 2019, saying prosecutors had failed to prove their case. The verdict was appealed but upheld in late March, clearing the way for Gbagbo to leave Belgium, where he had spent the past two years. While thousands celebrate his return, his opponents maintain he should not be given a statement's welcome. Nevertheless, Thursday was mostly a day of jubilation for Gbagbo's supporters who long have maintained his prosecution was unfair and politically motivated. Now moving on, the United States through Special Envoy for Climate, John Kerry has said that it has plans to increase funding to Egypt in order to help the northern African country shift from fossil fuels and embrace solar energy. We have more. Speaking to members of the press after meeting Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukrai, the U.S. Special Envoy for Climate John Kerry said that Egypt is blessed to be the number one country in the world for the opportunity of solar renewable energy, which President Biden is determined to increase their funding for adaptation and triple for resilience. Kerry said that the package comes with great economic opportunities like job creation, better health, cleaner air, greater security, and an ability to build a stronger, better future citizens. John Kerry added the world was still nowhere near meeting international goals that were set by the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. Major emitters of greenhouse gases are preparing for the next UN Climate Summit taking place in Scotland in November. The summit aims to relaunch global efforts to keep rising global temperatures to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, as agreed in the Paris Accord. Well, thank you so much, our reporter. Now let's go for a quick break. We shall come back with the business news.
Welcome back from the break. You're still watching TV Africa, the right to know. Now, in a business news today, although Togo relatively reports low numbers of COVID-19, which are 13,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases and 125 deaths, the West African nation has upheld strict emergency sanitary measures since April last year. Now, the move has indirectly dealt a blow to its agriculture-dependent economy, which relies heavily on cross-frontier trade. We have more. As the country's borders still remain closed, business and exports, as usual, are blocked between several of its neighbors in the region, such as states like Ghana, Benin, and Ivory Coast. Emmanuel Sogaji, the president of the Togo Consumers League, say that with public transport costs going up and prices of basic necessities, travelers and consumers are finding life difficult in almost all corners of life. Akoda Ayudan, the Minister of Communication and Media and spokesperson for the government of Togo, said that negotiations are underway between the various countries to determine the modalities of opening up the closed borders. The World Bank last year said in a report that the combination of closed borders Social distancing measures and restrictions on travel had delivered a heavy blow to Togo's economic activity. While on a public television in April, the Economy and Finance Minister, Sani Yaya, said that World Bank has approved a US$70 million US dollar credit to help Togo revive its economy, whose growth activity is forecast to accelerate by 4.8%. Away from business, in our health news today, the World Health Organization has said that Africa is in the middle of a full-blown third COVID-19 wave and there is need for more vaccination. The total infections have crossed the 5 million mark and at least seven African countries have run out of vaccines. We have more on this report. To World Health Organization's Africa Regional Director, Mashindu Somoweti, Africa needs millions more doses urgently to combat the awaited COVID-19 third wave. South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Ethiopia and Egypt have recorded the most virus cases in the continent. Uganda and Namibia are experiencing a deadly third wave with doses of fatalities recorded daily. A total of 136,030 people have succumbed to the virus in different African countries, according to World Health Organization. The Delta variant is in 14 African countries, while the Beta variant, first detected in South Africa, is in 25 countries. The World Health Organization says there is no clear timeline on when more vaccines will be available, but there is an urgent need for them. Now, away from health, let's turn your attention to our sports news today. A team of five athletes comprising of three boxers and one swimmer and a weightlifter has been flagged off by the Minister of State for Sports, Hamson Oboa. This is the first batch of the 27 athletes expected to represent Uganda at the Tochu 2020 Olympic Games. We have more. Uganda Bombers skipper Shadir Musabwogi, David Semuju and female boxer Catherine Nazri, alongside weightlifter Julia Sektoleko plus swimmer Ambala Atreiri were flagged off at the National Council of Sports Offices in Lugogo, Kampala. The contingent also had leader of delegation David Katende, who is the Assistant General Secretary at the National Council for Sports, Hakim Sempereza, the weightlifting coach, Medi Mulandi and Patrick Lihanda, the boxing coaches. This is the first batch of the 27 athletes expected to represent Uganda at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. 
The games will be staged between Friday, July 23rd, 2021 and Sunday, August 8th, 2021. The group which was flagged off on Thursday will set base in Izumisano for a pre-Olympic game training camp which is aimed at acclimatizing to the weather conditions in Japan. Mr. Obua called upon the athletes to go and lift Uganda's flag high at the games by putting up good performances. The Tokyo Olympics were supposed to take place last year, but with the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, the games were postponed for a period of one year. Well, thank you so much, our reporter. Now, before we end the bulletin, let's have a recap of our top stories. The Parliamentary Appointments Committee rejects two ministers. And Zambia announces 21 days of mourning for the founding father, Kenneth Kaunda. And in our sports today, Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games first batch of team, Uganda flagged off. Well, thank you so much for joining us. For more, we started from. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We shall keep updating you. It is TV Africa, the right to know. This is Africa, and that was the news.